Pat Mills is the creator and first editor of 2000 AD. He developed Judge Dredd and also created Action and co-created Battle Picture Weekly and Misty. He was the key writer on Crisis with his political thriller Third World War. He wrote the long-running internationally acclaimed anti-war series Charlie's War, illustrated by Joe Cohoon. And in 1982, he wrote Dan Dare in The New Eagle, initially with John Wagner, before continuing to write his adventures solo until issue 83. He has just created Space Warp, a science fiction comic aimed at readers of all ages. Ian Kennedy started at DC Thompson in 1949 as a trainee illustrator and in 1954 took the decision to leave and go freelance. Ian continues to work on cover art and private commissions to this present day, a career of 70 years and counting. Ian famously worked on creating thousands of covers for Commando, early issues of Star-Lord in 2000 AD, illustrated the Blake 7 comic strip, and in 1982 started work on Dan Dare in issue 19 of The New Eagle. Today, Pat and Ian join Peter Adamson, co-presenter of The New Eagle podcast, Where Eagles Dare, and Philip Vaughan, programme leader of the BA Honours in Concept and Comic Art at De Montfort University. If I could open with a, a, a question just for, um, for both of you, which is um, that the return of Dan Dare in Eagle uh, presented an opportunity to recast the character for a new generation of comic readers. I just wondered whether, um, of course, Pat, this was uh, your second opportunity after 2018. Um, where did you sort of come from with regards to your your ideas for, for how you would portray or, or uh, tell Dan's story? Uh, John Wagner and myself had um, written a, a film treatment on Dan Dare for someone uh, who owned the, the film rights to it, uh, a guy called Tony Dalton. And um, so when New Eagle was um, uh, came into being, um, we thought that would be a good place to uh, use our, our storyline. And so it, it kind of kicked off with um, uh, John Wagner would write some episodes, and I would write others, and and so forth. And that I, I think that was the um, I think it was Embleton who was um, uh, painting those episodes, hmm. and it was made more complicated. And this is why I to say it's messy because um, the film rights had now, as I understand it, reverted to uh, Paul De Savory, and either. Through his influence, or perhaps someone else, um, they wanted to uh, change Dan Dan Dare around a bit. And uh, the net upshot was that um, rather than it being uh, the original Dan Dare, it would now be um, I think his son. And that was kind of uh, John and I had no real uh, choice in the matter. That's that's what we had to go with. Um, I had some reservations about that uh, because it, anything that makes the character seem, um, you, you know, more more involved and more complicated, uh, it doesn't make it as instant uh, for the readers. But it was a problem, and we, and I think we had to overcome it, uh, and we did. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, and and Ian, of course, you you um, somewhat inherited the script. Uh, the strip from uh, from Jerry Embleton and Oliver Frey. Did you have any clear ideas going in uh, when you took on the artist responsibility? Well, I, I was rather rather pitched it pitched into it, uh, in that uh, I, I, I in the process of recovering from a, a car accident, mm -hmm. so I was out of action for a wee while, and um, I don't know how it came about, but Barry, I think it was Barry Tomlinson who got in touch with me and uh, asked, uh, I think Dave Hunt was involved as well, if I remember rightly, uh, asked me if I would like to take Dan on. And um, I, of course I jumped at it. Uh, I, I, I really, really in off the deep end because um, the way the way that the character had been portrayed, his, his, uh, his clothing, etc., didn't seem to me to be 
space-like at all. It was almost almost medieval in a way, some of the, uh, the, the clothes that he, he was uh, portrayed in. Uh, so I, I just took it upon myself to, to um, uh, revamp the whole thing. Uh, hopefully it was fairly successful. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Pat, I understood it to be uh, the original dance uh, grandson rather than son. But uh, uh, that, of course... No, you're meant... correct. Yeah. <laughs> Ah. And that meant then I could I could really uh, get get rid of the uh, an awful lot of the old of the old dam. Uh, to be quite honest, I think I'm being rather uh, how could I put it bold when I say this. I was never <laughs> terribly happy with the, the original dam. He was to me he was almost puppet like at times. Uh, I think possibly due to the fact that Frank did an awful lot of uh, copying from uh, uh, models, etc. Uh, yeah. People, people posing in the poses that he wanted. As a result, there was a there was a lack of movement, a lack, lack of humanity in the thing. So I, I, I took the chance to try and inject a bit of that. So I held on to pretty well most of the, the original uh, facial features, uh, especially the chin. Uh, and then I just took it from there. That was it. Just let my imagination run wild. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Pat, if I could turn back to you with regards to the old, the older Dan Deere, I was wondering if you had any uh, thoughts on, on, on whether you saw him as a bit of an establishment figure, uh, and, and if you did, whether that um whether that was in contrast to to a lot of your 2000 ad characters which I, i've tended to read as being quite anti-establishment absolutely <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah that was a challenge um just thinking about that well first of all um i'm a huge fan of the original dan there uh by frank hampson and, and ian's right there, there were there was that uh, uh kind of stiffness if you like about it and so on but um there was so much that worked and and it had so much to offer yeah. and i think what had happened on with 2000 ad we'd had this uh, uh other really extreme version of dan dare and and that had come about because I tried a conservative approach. I tried at least two artists, uh, one in Italy and one in Argentina, to try and get that original, uh, if you like, conservative look. And uh, it, it was boring. And I'd gone for the opposite uh, extreme, um, which worked. Um, but, Although it worked, that wasn't particularly apparent to me at the time, because there was, uh, if you like, uh, an understandable backlash against it from what you might call um, uh, traditional Dandere fans who objected to it. And I, I was very aware of that, and I didn't always pay enough attention to ordinary 2000 AD readers who actually really loved um what Ballard and Ellie had done uh, which was extreme um so um when it came to to doing Dan Dare in New Eagle um I really wanted to stay in the tram lines of the original character I felt that I had to do that because of all the uh, differing views on what had gone before. So I thought, okay, this time I'm going to put my, if you like, my anti-establishment uh, views to one <laughs> side, and I'm just going to do my very best to recreate Dan Dare the way, the way he once was. So if you like, I, I put, my, put my perspective on a back burner, and I thought, right, I'm going to see this through a different pair of eyes. And I quite enjoyed the process. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, very interesting. 
one uh, I guess one one difference with the uh, the new crew for, for Dan and the new Eagle was um, quite a diverse supporting cast. You had Sugar and Zeta or Helen Scott, as well as the resident tree. Yeah, um, I, I think one of the frustrations for me uh, uh, with uh, New Eagle is that almost uniquely in comics, it hasn't been collected. So normally before an interview like this, I'd be looking through the, the, the various book editions. Yeah. As I see, you've got your, your copies of uh, Eagle there. And uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, it's all recollection. I, I don't have the opportunity to refresh, but I, I remember, yeah, I, we, you know, I put a certain amount of thought into the uh, background characters and so forth. And um, what really um, drove me forward, and this was where it worked so well with Ian, um, was I thought, if Frank was around today, what would he do? What kind of story would he do today? And I figured it would be man's first journey to the stars. That, that would be the one he would do. And I thought, well, um, again, Frank was drawing on the, the technology and the science at the time. I think he would visited uh, the, the, um, the V rocket uh, sites in Holland as it, when he was in the war or things like that. So he was very much reflecting that kind of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that sort of uh, festival of Britain optimism for the future. And, and so I thought, OK, I'll do something similar. And so I drew on um, um, you know, the, the, the sort of various NASA programs and so on. And it, it, it was I was very, very, very lucky to have Ian to draw, draw that because Ian, as we all know, has this great feeling for hardware uh, and, and can bring all these things to life. Um, any other artist would have, would have told me to get knotted. <laughs> so thank you, <laughs> Ian, for drawing all those incredibly um, complex ideas uh, those NASA ideas that I was recreating for um, man's first journey to the stars, I think. Yeah, I was going to ask that question, Pat. Did, did you actually alter the course of the story to play up to, to Ian's strengths? Or were you always going to go in that direction? Or were you reacting to Ian taking over when he took over in issue 19 and, and realised that, that obviously because of his, his background and uh, doing all the, the airships and, and, and aeroplanes, that that, that that would be a good direction to take the, the strip in? Yeah, I, 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 it, was, it was a given, really, wasn't it? That... Uh... Um, you always play to an artist's strengths and to have that opportunity. Um, again, I, I wouldn't know with absolute certainty unless I was leafing through the, the original episodes. Um, uh, and of course, you know, as I say, it's, a, it's frustrating that, that uh, Dan Dare of, of all Britain's comic book characters hasn't been collected. Um, and but I, from memory, I'm thinking to myself, my God, that was a bit of a, uh, a risky thing to do, to have a story that was really following this rather um, uh, scientific basis for things. You know, in other words, how would it work? Um, I use, uh, I should say, for inspiration on that, um, uh, the book, uh, The Right Stuff which was the, the first step into space. Um, and there was some great material in there which kind of inspired me to do something uh, similar. But nevertheless, um, there was no Mekon. Uh, there was none of the, I mean, that came later with Ian and I. But at this point, you've got very much a kind of um, uh, almost Patrick Moore type uh, story about uh, going into space. and. Obviously, I must have found enough conflict to make it work. But, you know, this Saturday morning, I'm thinking, my God, did I really do that? That was a bit, <laughs> that was a bit risky, but it, it worked. And, and even that surprises me. And obviously, it's down to the quality of 
um, uh, of the Indian's artwork, and also I think the the diligence that I put into the story to get it right. Um, but if it hadn't had worked, that's one of the things with with comics is you would soon hear about it from the editor. He would be very quick to tell you the readers hate this. Get rid of it. So yeah. I know it worked, but I'm yeah. still scratching my head as we speak. I think I think I think that uh, uh, to interrupt. Um, I think at that time uh, we were we were going through almost the, the threshold the threshold of of space exploration, real real yeah, and out in space if you get me on the moon, uh, all the various uh, NASA projects etc. And I I have a feeling just sitting listening to you here, uh, we were almost like a couple of sheets of blotting paper. And we were soaking all this up, you as the writer and me as the artist. Uh, we were soaking it up, and and that's that's just how it came out in 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 our attempts to to portray the portray, portray the situation. And it just so happened it was Dan Dare, <laughs> almost accidentally. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think. Um, I think readers at that time, um, young readers, uh, were fascinated by the whole uh, business of space. I think mm -hmm. uh, that's possibly not quite the same today, where you know the, the, there isn't the immediacy, the excitement that perhaps there once was. So you're right. I think we were riding on that excitement, which is hard to imagine today. Because you think, okay, I mean, it's still it's still of interest, but it doesn't make um, headlines in the way that perhaps it once did. Mm -hmm. Much more matter of fact, matter of fact nowadays. Oh. It's, a, it's taken for granted, so to speak. Now, if I could go on about the, the, the script, um, uh, I'll spare, try and spare Pat's blushes, but uh, <laughs> the scripts that I got to work on, uh, I, they, just, they just sparked me off immediately. I had no absolutely no trouble at all in, in in imagining exactly what he wanted. And I'm pretty sure I'd, uh, I perhaps didn't give you at times, but just exactly what you what you envisaged. But um, it, 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 I got enough from them to, to well, it, it really it really did spark me off. And uh, having been uh, a, a frustrated pilot myself, I, I didn't want to do this as a, as a career. I wanted to fly with the boys in blue. Uh, but uh, uh, you, it was your trouble. That was it. End of story. But I have an abiding uh, uh, interest in anything aeronautical, uh, and I just love painting and drawing airplanes. And um, of course, uh, the, 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 the machines that I devised in in the Dandier situations uh, were very much uh, uh, based on. The, the current designs of, of aircraft at that time, uh, and I just I just added bits and pieces here and there, um, and I one of the best uh, uh, compliments I ever had from a from a fan was that when Ian does devise a spaceship, it looks as though it's going to work, um, and that I, that was as pretty. Pretty much as high a compliment as one could get the marks. Lovely. Um, uh, Pat and Ian, I, I at that time uh, you also had a, a, a third contributor for a few issues in in the the photos of uh, Julian Baum. Oh yeah. He yes. provided some, he, he provided some model photos for the uh, for the space uh, cadet stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you, you're probably aware that uh, I think Julian is, um, I think he's um, a professor at uh, uh, Liverpool Observatory now, or something like that. And I think he was on his way, uh, you know, up the ladder at this point. And he was making these incredible models and so forth. And again, I, I'm, I'm scratching my head as we speak and thinking, why did I do that? <laughs> um, I, I think 
um, you know, you know, I'd almost have to have a look at the 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 original pages and think, okay. But I, I remember he had this kind of real, um, uh, you know, as I say, he's really into space and so on. He's, a, uh, I think, he's an astronomer and so forth. And I think I wanted to bring that energy um, into the story. And and perhaps again, I was thinking of. Um, the original Dan Dare, where they often use models and things like that. And I suppose it was like, maybe this is a way to, to help recreate that original flavor um, of the story. Um, so, so that was the plan. I wonder whether it might have been introduced as well um, to, to help you out on the deadline issue, because I was amazed that, I was amazed that you were able to produce two, then three, then four pages of painted comic art uh, every week. So I, I wonder whether there might have been an element of that in there. Yes, well, certainly it was a, <laughs> we started off as part most uh, with a, a colored center spread. Uh, and then they decided that it would go on front cover, uh, which did increase the workload support. And then it was decided to go on back cover as well. Uh, of course, at that point, it was obvious that there was no way I could keep that uh, rate up without ending up in a loony bin somewhere. <laughs> so uh, if what we ended up was I I did this, the, the cover full colour, the centre spread black and white, and the, cover, and the back cover black and white, and it, uh, these were uh, coloured by John Burns. Did a smashing job. The way, um, uh, it, it, uh, it 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 just took off like Topsy, I suppose. Topsy it growed. Yeah, that wasn't on all the issues though. That was just on, on a few issues. Uh, I know that it reverted back to you when you had the time to fully paint it. And if uh, he did a very good job of recreating your color palettes, but you can tell you can tell the difference. At least I can tell the difference between the two. But he did a very good job of of matching up. Um, I understand. And and you you you're right, Phil. Uh, that uh, it's come back to me now. Of course, that was another reason that we. Um, uh, use Julian on those kind of model sequences uh, because it gave Ian more time. And uh, I mean, it's amazing the the kind of um, makeshift rules that we we operate by in comics that we have to do things like that to keep the keep the character in the comic. But it, it made sense. Uh, we had to do it. Mm -hmm. Needs must when the devil drives, so to speak. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much. Yeah. Yes, I, I I suppose being being up in Dundee, uh, I, I was somewhat uh, divorced from all that that uh, uh, the, the politicking and and the arranging of this that sort of thing. So I I really wasn't aware part of just how much was having to you know to be uh, done to arrange. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it, it is the challenge of a, of a weekly comic that you've got to keep doing, you've got to keep it out there, and then how do you achieve that? And you've got to make compromises. And, and I think the, the great thing is that, uh, um, as far as I'm aware, um, the, the readers were very tolerant and very positive about that. But they're not always that tolerant and positive. So uh, I'm, I'm feeling quite relieved about it as I'm, I'm thinking back and thinking, <laughs> my God, we got away with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm a wee bit puzzled myself, like you, uh, that uh, our dad didn't take off to the same extent as, well, uh, Doctor Who, of course, is something yeah. sort together. But we, we haven't even approached uh, that sort of situation with Dad. It just, he's just He's just died a natural, hasn't he, somewhere or other? And I wonder if that's something to do with the, the fact that it has lain dormant and uh, not been reprinted for, for so long that, that there could be a whole new audience out there for, for this work and they're not able to access it. I mean, even the creators are struggling to access the content, which tells you something, uh, you know, which is a real shame because I think it I think it stands up. I think it stands up to scrutiny. Yes, I, I don't 
I, I, the, the move back to letterpress didn't help any either, did it? Oh my God! Yeah, later. Yeah, I think. Um, I think by that point, I think I'd exited stage left. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. yeah, I mean that's always that's always one of these uh, challenges on, on comics, where uh, especially in that era, they you know the, the the comic isn't making enough money for them. Uh, mm. So what do you do? You go in for cheaper printing. Um, I would imagine that there must have been some uh, some fallout over that from the readers, and and understandably so. But um, I mean, all of us as as you know as creators and fans of Dan Dare, we we all want the very very best. Um, publishers saw it a little more with a bit more cold blood. You know, they they didn't have quite the same enthusiasm shall we say that, that we all have uh -huh. <laughs> i wonder perhaps if they had uh, instead of weekly could they have done it fortnightly or even a monthly and made a really good job of it uh, oh. I don't, would, that have, <laughs> would that have crossed their mind i don't know <laughs> uh, yeah i i think i think their perspective was probably that the readers expected Dan Air in there every week. So if it if it dropped out or if the the um, the, the circulation you know things changed. Mm. So I, I remember another thing that uh, um, that I did, and we might come on to that later, perhaps. Um, and this again was was partly influenced by wanting to to link together. Um, the original Dan Dare with the Dan Dare we had today. In other words, uh, you know, forget forget the whole 2000 AD thing. I, I really wanted to go down that kind of conservative path. So uh, my recollection is that um, I got in touch with um, an original Dan Dare fan called Alan Vince, and I think he supplied me with um, some material. Uh, and I try, and I think I may have featured it in the story in the original with the original art, or it may have been redrawn. I'm not sure, but I have a feeling it was the former. And it, it was to try and bind the two uh, the two versions of Dan Dare more closely together, um, which I, I, I almost saw as a kind of penance for my my sort of uh, 2000 AD Dan Dare. Um, <laughs> But I think it may also have been used for um, uh, for time purposes as well. It, it may have saved time. This is obviously moving ahead to after uh, Dan has made this uh, first trip to the stars. Then you've got the uh, we go back to the Mekon, uh, and it was somewhere in there that I really wanted to uh, um, give a new look. To Frank Hampson's original voyage to Venus, which I thought was fantastic, and I I wanted to kind of make it um, appealing to um, to a new generation, if you like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was a hard act to follow. Uh, yeah. I could remember when the first uh, first uh, copy of Eagle came out back in when was it was it fifty fifty one something around right about then. Yeah, uh, it was nothing short of revolution. Yeah, and uh, it deserved its huge and success. To, yes, and to try to follow it, um, even at a much later date, was a, 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 a monumental job, really, to try and follow that. Um, I thought perhaps, the, being a different generation, i.e. as I thought his grandson, but you thought perhaps son. Um, no, I think you're right. Might, this is might have helped. It might have helped. Um, and I, I thought between us, we I don't think we did too bad a job. Um, but I think when we also being overtaken by uh, uh, IT technology, all that sort of thing, the children were just not reading. Going back to, to Pat's point, I just, just want to pick up on something that Pat said, is that I do remember that they did feature a couple of episodes of uh, reprinting the Frank Hampson stuff, and then they asked Ian to reinterpret some of the Frank Hampson pages. 
uh, around a, a segment which was called the Dare Report, where it looked back on the origin or the new origin of the original Dan Dare. Which, and this is where it starts to get really complicated, because Pat, you'll maybe be able to fill in the blanks here, but he was actually meant to be an RAF pilot from the 19. 19- 50s who'd gone forward in time and retconned pretty much the whole of the original Dan Dare series in the process. Now I'm pretty sure that was something to do with this film a pitch. Yeah, it was. And um I hadn't brought that up, but it was in the back of my mind. Because, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I that was no no no, I think it's important to mention it. It's uh, um yeah, yeah, I I think you know one of the things about uh, good comic book characters like Dan Dare is they can stand and survive a lot of battering. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. if, if he wasn't a good character to begin with, he couldn't have stood. Because the, I, I can see the kind of logic behind why the filmmakers might have wanted to have done that, because they wanted to acknowledge um, that that glory of the RAF and and. Battle of Britain and all that kind of stuff, but um, it's a misguided idea, clearly. And, and I think you know when you look at the the 1951 um, Dan Dare Voyage to Venus, I mean it, it's got that kind of British triumphalism about it. It, it. it exudes Festival of Britain or whatever was going on at the time. I mean this is a Britain that um, I kind of enjoyed. Uh, this is sort of capturing elements of that, uh, which I'll go on to in a moment, because but it's just to set the scene. I mean, the uniforms and everything, they, they look so British, and yet they were green. Uh, <laughs> and of course, as an aside, uh, you doubtless know that there were variants uh, before that one went ahead. I think there was possibly a different color, and there was a different role for, for Dan Dare before he became uh, the, the, the one that Hanson went with. But I, I tried to continue with that triumphalism, which I kind of enjoyed, where I think the, the head of, um, I've forgotten his exact title, I think he was certainly a knight of some sort, and he was British. So the, the head of Space Command, you know, was well, not that, American, he was that British. Was so- that was Sir Hubert, wasn't it? Sir Hubert. Sir Hubert Guest. With yes. his pipes. Sir, <laughs> Sir Hubert Guest was the original, but I reenacted that uh, in, in the Mekon adventure. Ah, well, I yeah. can't remember. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He was nicknamed the Fox, I remember. Yes, this, yes, he was. The Space Fox. Yeah, the Space Fox. <laughs> right. <laughs> he, he was, he was, uh, it was the idea that the head of this whole usually American uh, space command, you know, that would be the normal perception. But here in the in this alternative reality, uh, Britain was still very much at the forefront. And I, I quite enjoyed uh, having that character. Mm-hmm. It, it's certainly been an idea that's been revisited a few times since um, with the, the Ministry of Space and, and other um, and other enterprises. So you may have been ahead of the game there. Well, I think Ministry of Space, the, uh, I gather the story is not always, doesn't always live up to the, the image on the front cover, but the front cover is fantastic. Ministry of Space, that's really gone back uh, almost before, uh, well, my impression is, is uh, covered by Chris Weston, and it, it's absolutely brilliant. And, uh, uh, but it almost feels pre-1951, uh, you know, about 1948 or something. And uh, there really is, um, I think there's a, a there's a kind of energy about that that time that you know perhaps perhaps we baby boomers were trying to trying to catch. Uh, um, you know, it's a very positive side of Britain, um, which doesn't happen very often, especially in the miserable era we live in at the moment. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, I, I mean. In, a, in another in another universe, I, I would have loved to have done something like that, to have gone back to that really early uh, period. Um, uh, but yeah, the, all we can do really often is do the best we can and make things work in this very demanding uh, medium where, you know, the episodes are rolling by, you've got 
only a few weeks to get something out. There's there's limited numbers of pages and so on. Um, it, it, it can be very challenging. And I actually find I'm getting more aesthetic and more purist as I get older, which isn't a very good thing, you know, because uh, <laughs> you know, comics still today, they still have that kind of McDonald's element of, you know, get it out there, knock it out. And uh, I, I'm not quite so comfortable with with doing that as I, as I once was. <laughs> yeah, that that kind of burn rate, I suppose, of, of episodes must have been must have been a real challenge, and, and that compressed time. I mean, originally two pages to fit in that amount of of uh, of story and artwork is an incredible challenge. I, I I don't know how it actually worked, but but it did work, and I think. Um, it, it's very rare to see that even in, in 2000 AD at the time the, the, the stories were five six pages uh, so they, they had a bit more room to breathe whereas you've got this huge compression on storytelling and I suppose in a way Ian you were used to that having worked for DC Thompson's where they would have you know 9, 10, 11, 12 um, pa um, frames on a page sometimes um, which, which compared to say 2000 AD and I know Pat you, you instigated a lot of this where the pages were much more like American comics where they had less panels and there was more impact so um, I suppose you know when they added the front cover element which again was harking back to the original Eagle uh, was interesting it just gave the strip a little bit more room to breathe yeah I, the, the other thing of course is um, when when the when you only have say two pages um you really go for the jugular on it and therefore you it really help, helps you focus your mind you're thinking what's going to have an impact with the readers and so um anything that's maybe not so important gets pushed to one side and you really make it work and of course there's there's a long tradition of this i mean there are um uh Long before my era, I suppose things like Flash Gordon and so on were probably one page or something like that. So um, I, I can I can see the, the the potential in it. It's almost like a almost like a newspaper strip, which is you know people will follow that was it every day, I suppose. And uh, but you know they're they're quite short, and yet they still draw you in, and you still have followers. So although it sounds um uh quite brutal in a way just being too paid there is an upside to it there's no dross in those those there's no oh that was a boring episode it's all got to be good ian those front covers um afforded you to to provide some utterly panoramic images um on our podcast um we uh we recently did a a survey of of the um uh, the offset era of of New Eagle, and one of your covers, which is actually behind me, came up as uh, one of the the, the listeners' favourites, uh -huh. uh, which was <laughs> um, was it what was alongside the challenge? Was there a, an element of sort of um, freedom in, in having that space to work with as well? Uh, do you have? Did you say you have it behind you somewhere? That cover. It is. Oh, uh, this one. Oh, yes. These, 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 uh, these front covers. Um, uh, how can oh, I put can it? See it? Yes, I can just, I can just Up see a little it. bit. Yeah. I know what you're on about. These, these rather composite, composite covers, I would call them, so to speak. Yes, oh, that's. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, it was, it was generally the, the opening, obviously the opening uh, shot of that particular. Uh, episode and um uh, oh, that's I, beautiful very very fortunately that uh, would give me a chance to get going doing something like this because he knew exactly that getting getting catching the the, the, the reader's eye on the, on the newsstand uh, is, is well exactly what you want to do yeah um, uh, so of course if you could uh, Put in as much interest and color, of course. Color is something that um, I, I suppose I have. It's an instinctive thing. To me. It's innate. I have this sense of color, uh, not only uh, color against color, but talking about color temperatures, etc. 
where you you have a, say a warm colour on, on the object itself, or you want to back it up with say a cool colour, thereby thereby getting contrast that way as well. So uh, I really did enjoy these um, uh, these eagle covers very much. So um, well, I'm, I, I'm looking at them now for the first time in probably quite a few years. Uh, the one, the couple that Phil held up, and I can see why. Well, I can see first of all why it was so popular because it's like, wow, that's pretty amazing. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, these are um, wonderful scenes. I mean, that that's very much one of those NASA type scenes, if I recall, with you know, with the whole solar. You know, I can remember reading all these articles on how it would work and blah, blah, blah. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, I, what I can also see is um, the amount of time it must have taken you to have, you know, to have produced that kind of artwork. Um, I think it's, I think generally speaking, two pages a week of that quality is about all most artists, including yourself, can manage. Is that right? Yes, very much so, very much so. Uh, a cover like that uh, would probably would probably take me a couple of days. Um, although I, I was very fortunate in that uh, when I started doing color work seriously, uh, it was probably with commando covers in, in Thompson's. About the same time, the acrylic paints came on the market. And uh, I've always been a person uh, when something new in the way of uh, uh, equipment comes on them. I, I love to try them out, experiment, etc. So uh, when they came on the market, um, of course I did give them a good old try. I, I found that they could be very time consuming if you used them in pasto, if you see what I mean, uh, like a, an oil painting. Uh, but, uh, so I devised very much during the time I did Dan Deere, I devised uh, what I call my kiddies colouring book technique in that I would do black and white uh, ink, black and white ink sketch and then colour it in just like a kiddies colouring book. But then by taking the acrylic paints and watering them right down till they were just like watercolours, I could then just Lash the colour on top of this black and white um, sketch. And if it needed a bit more, I could put a bit more on it until I got the depths I wanted. So it, it became quite a quite a, a fast technique, shall we say. Cutting, cutting it down, cutting the time for a cover like that down by probably when I think on it, about 50%. So when I started off doing colours, uh, covers uh, initially, it would maybe take me two and a half days, something like that. I got it right down to one and a half to two days. And that made a heck of a difference to the week. That's still incredibly fast, to be fair. <laughs> I think, uh, I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, teaching comics and, and, and in the digital space now, where, where most of the creators work, um, there's certain shortcuts you can take to colour and you've got Photoshop and you've got other programs where you could capture colors and but but you're mixing this up and I know from personal experience of working with acrylics um whilst it is a, a good medium to use it's still quite tricky to get it exactly how you want it and I suppose sometimes you might have had a happy accident in, in when you're mixing up colors or how it sits on a page um but it's by no means easy I I, I can't even the even the, the getting it down to even the two and a half days seems quick to me, to be fair. Uh. <laughs> Listen, I hope you're not going to ask me to admit to happy accidents. <laughs> <laughs> they, happen all the time. they happen all the time. Um, uh, as I say, uh, this business of being able to wash over more colour. So, for instance, if I put a, a, a shade of green down in an area and I decided as I went on over the whole picture, that that shade of green was rather too cool. Then I would just take a wee wash of red, very thin wash of red, wash it over the top of that green, which you can do with acrylics. 
You can't do that with watercolours, where they go muddy. All that happens with acrylics is they become even more vibrant. And the one, the one really tremendous advantage is that they, they reproduce so well, thereby giving us, I don't know, as, as, as seeing these spreads in, in Nigo, just how well they came up. It, it boggles my mind that this is all pre-digital as well, because uh, modern artists have so much more option mm -hmm. to work with to manipulate those images. Um, certainly the colour leaps off the page. Yes, yes. Huh? Yes, Phil, Phil and I have discussed this uh, situation <laughs> often enough, uh, and uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, uh, computer graphics, uh, the colour, it's, it's definitely improving. They're, they're much more able to, to grade the colour, uh, change colours, etc., than they used to. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that someday on the computer, uh, you'll be able to feed your stuff into the computer and there'll be a little button, bottom right, which will have uh, AL marked on. And you press that, and that is artist's license. <laughs> artist. we're, all, we're all waiting on that, Ian. We're all waiting on that. <laughs> Inject that into your computer graphic. Uh, is it my under, it's my understanding, and I, I don't know if this is correct. Um, are T Titan Books um, reprinting the new Eagle down there at some unspecified point in the future? Is they, they are reprinting the originals and I've been doing the series for quite a while now. The original Dan Dare's, I think a, a few, about three years ago, they brought out a new Dan Dare comic, but that kind of, that, that kind of stopped midstream. Um, but they did promise at that time that they'd eventually get to the new Eagle um, Dan Dare's and reprint those as, as the next part of the collection. Um, but everything's a bit up in the air at the moment with that, I think. And the fact that that new version of Dan Dare didn't continue. And, um, you know, I'm not quite sure what the status of that is. But obviously, they have a relationship with the Dan Dare Corporation. And they've obviously licensed the, the original book. So there's no reason why they couldn't negotiate to do this run. You know, uh, although I think, again, actually, there is going to be a cost involved in cleaning up the the scans from the, the original comics and then how you deal with the double page spreads in a in a collection. However, I, I seem to remember that the 2000 AD, the Rebellion reprints of the Dan Dare from 2000 AD dealt quite well with the double page spreads by making the middle bleed a bit wider so that when you open the page up, it kind of still goes scans across. It, it's yeah, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if it's going to take a lot longer before um the the new eagle down there comes out because um yeah it does feel a bit woolly the the schedule um and and that's sad because um yeah i think we we all want to see it and after seeing those copies you held up uh phil i'm thinking oh my god you know i i just can't wait to see this this beautiful collection um well you know, ho hopefully it will happen. There is a small matter of a few episodes which were uh, rendered in, in the letterpress. Now, there's a thing, you see, I, I, I and me and Peter have had this discussion already, to be fair, but 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 there's an, there's an opportunity for, for whoever reprints it is to, to commission Ian to, to, to paint those, those final pages, you know, those, those final five episodes. I wouldn't mind in the least. <laughs> well, you heard oh, it first. <laughs> oh, what, what an opportunity. What an opportunity. It's, ah. Oh. Yes, I'm always available, shall I say. Well, that, that, that's fantastic to know, Ian. That is really fantastic to know. And uh, uh, I, I really hope there, are, you know, I mean, what it needs really where Dan Dare is concerned, and I'm not putting myself forward for this. It needs a mover <laughs> and shaker to make it happen. Yes, uh, well, I, probably I, a fairly thankless task, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it needs someone to really get behind it. And I think that often happens with um, with great comics and great characters. Is everyone loves it, but it needs someone to get behind it and say, "Okay, 
this this is going to happen and uh yeah it's, it's it would not be an easy task but i hope if anyone's out there is watching is thinking yeah that could be me you know who knows it, it just needs a bit of energy behind it to to um to yeah. nag everyone concerned and say do it the interest is out there because yeah. i i personally i'm uh, quite often quite frequently uh, doing a little commission for for a private uh, member of the public of Dan Deere, the Mekong, or whatever, uh, for them to hang on their studio wall or whatever. So the interest is out there. If someone yeah. is uh, some, uh, how can we, uh, beneficially minded millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, as I say, I, it, I, I, it's, it's surprising actually that um, Dandere Corporation, you know, themselves aren't um, aren't doing anything. It, it can be sometimes that people just get lost in the in the detail of who owns what and where it is and and things like that. But I mean, there is there is so much uh, enthusiasm and love um, for the. Uh, uh, New Eagle uh, uh, series. Occasionally, I um, will tweet about it, and I'm sure. And after this, I, I will will mention it, and, and I'm sure there'll be, you know, lots and lots of comments from, um, uh, you know, readers of your generation saying, "Yeah, when's it coming out?" You know, <laughs> and so on. Right. That's it. it, it you know, I'm I'm constantly amazed. If one had told me, say, 10, 15 years ago. And um, I would have tended to have poo pooed it because I thought really uh, it, 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 everything's it was all on the slide, it was all on the way out. Uh, but uh, I'm constantly amazed at just how much interest there is up, out there. I don't, uh, Peter, you might tell me about how how things are in New Zealand, for instance, uh, with regard to <laughs> the industry. How how much how much headway do we make? out there uh we're doing our little best Ian. <laughs> that's all i can say but that is an interesting point though peter because you know how i, I kind of know the answer to this question but i've just put it out there is that how did how did the all, all these british comics kind of kind of land in, in in new zealand at the time and, and was there a fan base and were they distributed in the same way that they were in the uk uh probably not uh, Philip, um, uh, the general rule of thumb, which my co-host David and I have, have agreed on, was that uh, comics arrive three months late in New Zealand, um, pretty regularly through your local news agent. Um, I wasn't aware of any clubs uh, and um, and we never got the giveaways. It was nice to have your country's name on the cover, <laughs> whether it was in galactic <laughs> groups or, or since. <laughs> yes. uh, no, I, I have. Uh, a correspondent who lives in Vienna, and he sent me a, one of these little memory sticks, uh, uh, absolutely full of of uh, material done by um, uh, artists out in East Europe, uh, very similar to the sort of stuff we do. And I just wondered, surely it's gone further than just Eastern Europe. There must be something out there towards uh, Southeast Asia and, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, some sort of movement, perhaps. It was always uh, Australia, Malaysia, and Ireland were, were listed on the uh, on the cover as other prices, but it obviously went beyond that. I think one of the lovely things about the uh, the the New Eagle is that it did have a facility where readers could send in a sort of a passport photo of themselves and where they were from and, and you would get uh, readers from um, um, African countries uh, I think Papua New Guinea may have turned up uh, and uh, around the Pacific as well there we are the lucky uh, six yes yes <laughs> so that that gave you some indication of of the the coverage I think they were pretty good days yes yes now, I know, Ian, you do get commissions from, uh, you know, I know you've done a commission for someone in New Zealand and Australia and all, all over the world, I suppose. That, and, and that is the, the, the great thing about digital now is that it does open up uh, the communication channels where, where back in the day it was just a letter, you know, in the post. And, and even the feedback on, on the strips was done with the, 
cut out coupons, which of course I would I would never do. You know, never cut up either the prog or, or the new eagle to fill out the forms. But but they were vitally important, weren't they, Pat? That 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 feedback that you got directly from the the readers. Oh yeah, huge hugely so. Um, and um, yeah, if you you would count up the votes from um, uh, you know, in other words. The readers would vote for say this was my favorite story this was a story i didn't like so much or i hated or whatever and um you would you would we had these kind of graphs where we would follow the success of the story and i think it was a really really good method um because uh, it was really responding to the reader very very quickly so um on occasion i, I might um write a particular story and the editor would say uh, that episode went down really well so can you give it more of that so you you would actually be changing the story or tweaking the story a bit to respond to what readers wanted and similarly if for some reason the readers didn't like it uh, you would you know you'd almost kill it off in in uh, in mid serial i mean it sounds very brutal but it worked there was none of this um what should we say that this feeling of well do readers really like it or not the, the the creators had to respond to the readers and that's mm -hmm. very different i think to um a comic medium maybe elsewhere for example in france the creator produces something and he finds an audience and but he's primarily producing or at least the the uh, the artists I've spoken to, they're, they're producing for themselves mm -hmm. uh, and then finding an audience. Whereas we as creators, we're, we're really responding to the readers. And I think that that really sharpened us up. We, we, knew, ex you know, we knew exactly what, uh, what readers wanted. Uh, they wanted action and they wanted excitement, but they also wanted subtext as well. I mean, to just if you just had a story with just lots of space battles with no subtext, no soul to it, um, it's unlikely that it would have uh, stayed the course. So, yeah, the, the reader polls were really important. And I think there came a point on 2000 AD, at least, where they were often in conflict with, um, uh, with what fans were saying. So fans tended to like uh, shall we say the, the the more sophisticated stories, the stories where the the writer or the artist had a fan following, and that could often be very different to the voting coupons. Um, so the 2000 AD solution was well, we just do away with the voting coupons. You know, in other words, <laughs> you've lost your right to vote. <laughs> That's a little simplistic, but it's not far off the truth. Believe me. I think on Eagle, you didn't have that conflict. Uh, between uh, some readers of what I would call, you know, ordinary readers and really dedicated hardcore fans. And it could be quite divisive uh, on 2000 AD. It definitely was. But I think I think you were spared all that on, on Eagle. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Who needs it? <laughs> Did you ever get any feedback direct from the readers, Ian, at the time? Or was it all coming through editorial for you? I think I didn't really get much feedback from readers at all. It's only latterly, uh, as time has gone on, that uh, the comments have come through. Yeah, I mean, that's something that um, I've only recently discovered, uh, got the picture of on 2000 AD, is that um, you, you're very much writing and painting in a bit of a bubble, and the the only information coming through to you is is the editor through the editor. Now, in the case of Eagle, that was fine because the editor was was Dave Hunt, and I will always sing his praises because he was a damn good editor. He'd been the editor on Battle before. Here, here. And when information was coming through him, uh, it was it was true. You know, it, it was valid. That wasn't always uh, the case on 2000 AD. So I've only discovered, for example, probably in the last five or so years, how popular certain artists were, mm -hmm. uh, like Ballardinelli, um, 
uh, and various other foreign artists. Um, at the time, I was more or less told um, that they didn't, that their stories didn't work. And Rebellion, to their credit, have really changed that by reprinting some of those artists. Yeah. Um, and I, I was quite surprised, uh, you know, that, uh, as I say, for example, uh, Ballard and Ellie's Dan Dare um, actually has a, a, a really strong um, uh, following. You know, a lot, a lot of readers love it. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't the information I was getting at the time. Um, and um, yeah, so as a, you know, I'm still learning what, what the audience actually liked. As I say, on, on Eagle, um, it was different. I think it was much more clear cut what they liked, what they didn't like, which is great. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, I, I agree with you vis a vis Dear Font, uh, yeah. an excellent man to work with at all times. Um, we, we built up quite a, a relationship over the years. Uh, he would just uh, phone up and say, Can can I take such and such on? And of course, I would uh, I, very luckily I have a, a fair sense of timing and just how much I'm going to manage to do in the next couple of weeks, three weeks, months time. Um, and he, he once commented that uh, he reckoned that uh, when he phoned me up, I would have my diary on the desk uh, and I would be able to say, yes, Dave, I can do this, but I can't do that. Um, uh, and I said, no, Dave, I'm afraid it's just sheer instinct. And <laughs> much prefer to tell you no, I'm not going to be able to make it. Rather than take it on and let you down. Uh, and because of that, we did build up a very, a very, a friendly as well as professional relationship. No, he, he, he was a, uh, a great, great editor. Uh, and that makes such a difference to us. Yes. As as creators, if if the editor, what shall we say, doesn't know what they're doing or isn't uh, completely professional and so on, then you are in, not in a good space. Uh, it's it's uh, yeah. So the good editors really do need recognizing. Mm. Look, Phil um, and, and gentlemen, I think I think we covered pretty much everything except just to say um, if I might poach one of your questions, Philip. Uh, Pat, you mentioned earlier about a sense of having having paid your penance on Dare when it came to the end of your time. Um, you did leave a few tantalising clues as to where the strip might go. Um, I believe uh, there was a threat of uh, Dan and his crew taking the fight to Venus. But do you recall leaving the strip with a sense of satisfaction and yeah. that sort of? Yes, that was that was very much it. it, it I felt. Um, I had to sort of do my particular bit to bring it back as far as I could to its former glory. Uh, and I think it was also to do with uh, the fact that I was starting to recognize, well, if you're going to revive a character, e even, if it, even if it's successful, like say Ballardinelli's version, um, that, you know, there is that respect needed to the original version. Um, and, I, and I felt that I had, um, um, I, I'd missed out there, that I hadn't got that right. And so I needed to come back to it. And, and, it, and it was not only that, it was also because, um, you, you know, after the Ballard and Ellie, there was, a, there was another version uh, with Dave Gibbons, which was fine. And then it seemed to go off uh, in some other strange directions and so on. It, this is in 2000 AD. And so it's really like, yeah, we've, we've really got to get this right this time. And, and once that had been achieved, there was a sense of satisfaction of, of integrating the two uh, universes back into one, if you like, and saying, right, that's it. <laughs> time, to, time to leave, <laughs> time to go. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That, that was great. Thanks. And thank you, Sorry. Ian.